Hello Boxing Asylum listeners and welcome back to Punches from the Past, the show where we delve into boxing's rich history and talk about the fights that really matter. I'm Steve and joining me on the call for this customary live episode is Andy Patterson and Joe Kennedy. Yes, as usual, we end every season with a standalone live episode as this action-packed season four draws to a close, leaving behind the likes of Hopkins, Mayweather, Barrera, Morales, Ben, Eubank and many more in its wake. We asked our listeners to choose the next fight to cover. We polled, you responded, and tonight's episode was chosen. This time we travel back to 2007 and the bright lights of Las Vegas, where two unbeaten boxers locked horns for welterweight supremacy. A confident, brash Michigan native, one fight removed from crossing over into bona fide pay-per-view stardom, taking on a British hero eager to transfer his homegrown appeal and conquer Sin City as his fans drank the bars dry. Andy, it was a mix of styles, a clash of civilizations, as Floyd Mayweather and Ricky Hatton went into battle. Yeah, one of the most uh, even, well, eagerly anticipated fights that I can recall in my lifetime, at least. Obviously, you had Tyson Lewis uh, finally getting that one on, but I think the build up to this was something else. This was like really before social media really kicked off, uh, relying on Sky News and other outlets, YouTube, and that at that time, waiting for the uploads and that type of thing. So it was it was a must watch, you know event, Floyd, pound for pound number one, Hatton obviously at that point was, was the big star in, in the UK um, you know, he's rise to the top so to speak, you know, it wasn't without bumps along the way, obviously again, you know, against McGee getting dropped, it was the guy uh, Queros getting badly cut in Detroit, you know, there was a problem, obviously there was question marks about whether his skin could hold up because he's high cheekbones you know, the blown up in weight, but he still managed to kind of get himself doing it in a supreme fighting shape. But as you say, a genuine clash of styles, a pure boxer against a mauling brawler, basically. And uh, on the night, it just it came to the class and just levels, I suppose. Uh, just leading us in, Andy, Ricky Hatton's career up to this point, I suppose. He'd had some interesting moments, as you mentioned. There was the cuts, John Thaxton, Vince Phillips as well, who'd upset Costa's you. Uh, Carlos Mouso, he got cut as well against him. There was the Stephen Smith debacle when Stephen's dad, Darky Smith, ran into the ring and pushed Mickey Van. He had a lot of learning fights under that WBU banner, even though it wasn't until he fought to you that he won a genuine world title. It was supposed that was his learning trade. Sky were happy with the WBU back then. Frank Warren was happy to run him along. I think it was 13, 14 defences in total. That gave him his grounding, his seasoning before he went to America to chase the likes of Mayweather. Definitely. I mean, if you look at some of the some of those defenses, I forget how many there was. It must have been d- at least double digits. So they had mm-hmm. WBO title, so WBU title. Um, you know, some of the names you would probably well these days you you would class as you know probably fr- yeah fringe world level to contenders. Remember the Ben Taki fight? He was he was uh, I can't remember if he was hurt, but I think he got cut in that fight. Certainly tested again. Uh, at least obviously I mentioned Amy McGee dropped him in the first round. Really looked uh, a bit kind of sway that night. Uh, but as I say, he's coming up to like Isla Ray Oliveira, guys who'd obviously been over the course. It was it was good ground and it was it was it was solid opposition at that point. But also at the same time, as you could say, that were washed. You know, even after Zoo, if he'd take like Lewis Calazzo, um, okay, he would have a, an okay career afterwards. But still, I would say Calazzo was probably at that point a wee bit kind of best his, uh, past his best days. Carlos Mouser was made to order. Uh, really kind of like stand up. I remember getting, getting caught with chin in the air. But uh, because of Zoo fight, he was he was he was tested as well. Even though there was the prime Zoo as such, but he he went to the well that night, and it meant a lot to him as well. Actually, to do it in front of you know, 20, 20 odd thousand in Manchester would have been absolutely fantastic for him. Um, but it was at that point, at least he'd arrived. He was what I think he would probably be he would be pound for pound ranked as well. Running about that time as well, wouldn't he, mm-hmm. uh, Ricky Hatton? Um, and obviously tries to uh, step up in weight. Uh, against, um, as I say, Colazzo, come back down for a rango, and then obviously fought Castillo, dropped him with a brutal left hook to the to the ribs. I think he even broke a couple of ribs in that as well. But even at that time, if you listen to some of the American uh, commentators, and that some of the opposition that he fought, you know, especially Castillo, they said that he was washed, so he still had it all to do to really convince the American public at least. 
Yeah, we'd gone over to America, Joe, Andy referenced the Castillo knockout there with the body shot, the kind of body shots we'd seen folding guys like Michael Stewart and Freddie Pendleton. He'd had his ups and downs against Eamon McGee, the enigmatic Irishman who probably should have done better with his career had he had a bit of dedication. But Ricky had fought everybody at that time to get the grounding, get the experience. He was a ferocious body puncher, showed against Taki, as Andy mentioned, that he could be patient, that he could box, showed that against Vince Phillips as well. The Colazo fight maybe indicated a little bit that welterweight was going to be a bit too much for him, but he'd earned his way. With that Castillo knockout, Joe, that was the perfect way to go into the Mayweather fight, really. He was riding off a high. Castillo was a tough guy who'd had two good fights with Mayweather, I maintain to this day. Not to any great degree, but that, I thought Castillo won the first fight. So they had that kind of common opponent as well. But Ricky was coming in on a high after that knockout, Joe. Yeah, definitely. Great, uh, great lead into the into Mayweather fight, the big money fight. And... I think that was shown in the, the the amount of fans that went over to, to Vegas as well. I think uh, looking back on the fight yesterday, uh, you know, Colonel Bob's talking about the, the atmosphere there in the stadium and it seems absolutely electric, just full of Manchester fans. Uh, you know, the first time since uh, Davey, Mo- Davey Boy Moore at the Garden when a, a hometown fighter has been, you know, booed coming into the ring. So uh, I think that was all part of it, you know, coming off the success of the Castillo. Uh, the body shot, uh, the body shot knockout as well. You know, all those highlight reel knockouts do well for the pay per view numbers at the end of the day. It's on was Floyd Andy coming in. Meanwhile, he was thirty eight and zero at the time. We've gone through Floyd before in punches from the past and many other episodes as well. Going right. Back to Diego Corrales, which we covered on this as well, through Gatti, through Judah. But it was really De La Hoya earlier that year who had given Floyd a bit of a tough time for the first six rounds. He had come back, he'd show the kind of fighter he was, and he had made that step over then. He had taken the torch from De La Hoya as the pay-per-view superstar. Mayweather was riding a high. He was arguably at the peak of his powers coming into this fight, like I said, 38-0. and 0. We, we were starting to realise H- HBO might not have agreed at the time. We'll talk about them later on. But Mayweather was looking like an exceptional fighter and a big challenge for Ricky. Yeah, I suppose. And he needed that fight as well, actually, because I remember it was the, was it the Baldemir fight. He got booed out the arena that night. Mm-hmm. That, was like, mm-hmm. that was like six months prior to it. And obviously he needed... Neither like the, you know, the biggest, well, he was the biggest star in sports at that time, even though he was coming toward the end of it. Did you say press Mayweather first six rounds? I thought he was doing pretty well. He, he tried to rough him up on the inside. He tried to kind of he, use his size, work that left hand as best as possible. But you could just tell, again, this is that fight we're on. Floyd was picking his moments and, you know, single shots, making it count, making it look good in that as well, using his, his, his lithic ability. But um, this is the Gatti fight. Took him apart. You could just see if 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 you want to take an actual mirror image, shall we say, Gatti was probably kind of like the the fight you would look at with with Floyd and say, look, you know, fighting Hatton. You could see what was going to come, mm-hmm. and certainly with with Gatti at least at that point, he was well into forty odd fights, wars galore, and that. At least at this point, Hatton was 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 possibly at his peak. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe not in terms of weight, obviously, but certainly would be in terms of you know. Athletic, his, his own athletic ability, at least, that he would be at his peak. Uh, Floyd's um, shenanigans at welterweight, then Joe had gone up and beaten Sean Bay Mitchell, who was a good fighter back in the day. He'd fought Costa's U, but he, he was past his peak by that point. Floyd knocked him out. And then the back-to-back fights before De La Hoya, first against Zab Judah. The shine was taken off this because Judah was all set to fight Floyd in a big money kind of showdown if he beat Carlos Baldemir in New York. He lost to Baldemir. Floyd fought him anyway. I know in the 10th round, we had the whole fuss when Roger jumped in the ring and there was a bit of a scrap and that, but the shine had been taken off it. And then Floyd went on and fought Baldemir anyway. Baldemir was a tough, rugged fighter at the time. Far too slow of foot and of punch to give Mayweather any trouble. So he was going through one of those little sticky patches in his career. I've mentioned before when he beat Philip and Du, he was getting criticised earlier on there. He wasn't getting criticised that much, but like Andy said, the Baldemir fight, people were going, oh, he's boring. You know, he's fighting these lesser opposition. And then he stood up, beat De La Hoya, and then went on to fight Hatton as well. He was moving Joe into that next kind of stratosphere, Floyd. Yeah, I mean, he was already in lead fighter, probably pound for pound number one at, the, at this time. But, um, you know, I think with the Baldemir performance and I think, you know, maybe just in general at welterweight, he just didn't have that knockout power maybe, that elite, you know, Tommy Hearns power at that way. That would have maybe got rid of guys like Baldemir and other guys who he, he decisioned at the end, like, you know, people were crit- critical of his style, but didn't really have the hands of the power to get rid of guys at 147, I don't think. But 
Um, just a class fighter. Like I love what, back watching this fight. Uh, just how good Floyd was, and the the straight right hands that he gets into play early on, the jabs to the belly, and the jabs to the head. Often the same, the same look. You know, keeping him and guessing as he's coming in. He's just class acting. He just uses it in this fight in particular. But um, yeah, uh, not sure if I answered your question, but. <laughs> oh, you certainly did. Don't worry, Joe. You answered the question and also moved into the stylistic things, the unique style of Floyd, which we're going to be picking up on now as we go round by round. Just a quick shout out to anybody who's watching live. This is a live show. I did put the link in earlier. If you have any questions, comments or anything you want to throw in, put them into the live chat and I'll read them out. On to round one then, Andy. Jim, there's many versions of this flying about. Joe referenced the Colonel. Sky Sports had one. Couldn't quite stomach that. Yeah. I know Jump it was Ian Dark region. at the time. I was thinking maybe Bean or something. I went for the HBO version. Got Good a decent that. enough copy, you know, from the, our sources. And at the beginning, Jim Lampley straight away referencing Hatton's biggest wins against Zhu and Castillo. Both over-the-hill fighters in his estimation. But going into round one, Hatton's job was to close the distance. Floyd was looking to time him coming in. Now, Manny Stewart, the late, great Manny Stewart, love Manny. He mentioned Hatton's foot speed a couple of times as being a key to his success. Mayweather, he was definitely caught off balance a little bit, wobbled mm -hmm. slightly towards the end of the round. I don't think he was hurt, but nothing serious. But that was a round in the bank to Hatton, according to another late great, Harold Leatherman, on the scorecards. Yeah, Leatherman's scorecard was, uh, was quite close going through this fight, considering you know how the officials actually saw it as well. And you're right about Manny. You know, Manny was saying that possibly this would have been Floyd's hardest fight at this point, just purely for, for Ricky's foot speed, because he was obviously starting aggressively trying to get in at the pocket pretty quick, which was, I think he could have set it up better, jabbing right hand in his way in rather than just trying to walk at a distance because, you know, as as Floyd, as you say, try to time him, Floyd would just try and, you know, take a two or three steps back, try and time him with the straight right hand. He couldn't really miss him with the straight right hand, but you're right about uh, catching Floyd slightly off balance. It would look like kind of a cuff and left hook. Mm. Um, obviously staggered back, but he's, he obviously remained in his feet. And that. But I just think Floyd showed earlier as well, Probably the latter half of that first round, that Floyd knew how to mix it on the inside. Certainly, he was he was he was proven pretty quickly anyway that he wasn't going to be any any pushover for Hatton on the inside without doubt. I think things like uh, Floyd getting slightly wobbled as well, Andy. People were looking for things throughout Floyd's career, similar to Roy Jones after the after he beat Montel Griffin in the rematch, and he went on that mad run until the second Tava fight, and he was invincible. People were always looking for little reasons to say, "Oh, he got wobbled by so and so," or "He got dropped by so and so," or I remember they used to say about Floyd, "He got dropped by was it Carlos Hernandez?" He literally went down in pain after he punched yeah. Hernandez on the elbow. They were always looking for those little things. Oh, look, he got he got wobbled by Hatton. Was it Judah? Was it was it Judah? Fight actually, he, he supposedly touched down with his glove, and was it, it was, was that was it Judah or Mosley? The shot he took from Mosley was crazy. The right Aye, hand, that he was reacted a so well. Right yeah. can, can you remember the Judah fight, mate? Was it, was it that one that supposedly flooded touched down with his glove? Uh, it was ringing the bell, all right. Um, was he did he he that's when he hurt his hand, he touched, he touched down with his glove, right. I think I think it was, was, was it that fight or was it the other one? Hernandez, against Hernandez, sorry. when he hit Hernandez, he touched down with his glove. You might be right, Andy, with Judah. I can't remember exactly, but he was definitely struggling with Judah's speed for the first three or four rounds. I've just pulled it up there. So, yeah, it says Judah had the early success in the fight as a southpaw style. And quickness gave me away the problems. Floyd's glove touched the canvas in the second round after he was hit oh. by a short right oh, hook wow. from Judah. Richard Steele didn't rule out a knockdown. Maybe they turned the, turned the tide in the fifth. Yeah, I do remember that now, actually. Yeah, so... Um, what we sort of what we're discussing there actually? I was just I was just uh, saying briefly about um, Floyd being off Floyd balance by the left. Yeah, off around. balance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, obviously you know, a couple of question marks. Obviously as well. You you, you go back to the as I say the judo fight. You see, oh, he's maybe been dropped. He's he's got off of one there. Hatton's maybe you know slightly cuffed him. Shall we say by left hook? Um, but I think when you see Floyd maybe get tagged, so, sometimes he, he, he would get caught with something. Like we mentioned the Mosley fight, that I think it just really switches him on uh, and it just kind of like, gets down to work. Because uh, see, I go back to how, how impressed I was just to how Floyd worked on the inside in this fight. It was actually was to take to take it into Hatton's office, so to speak, you know, for good portions of this fight, to maul it. I think it was absolutely one of Mayweather's, probably one of his most complete performances. Uh, into round two, Joe. Um, Joe Cortez starts to make himself a little bit of a factor. He warns Hatton for holding, starts to negate his inside game. People have mentioned this ever since, Hatton himself as well. 
I don't think that Joe was that big of a factor as maybe some people suggest, but he was definitely a nuisance in the early rounds, I think. And obviously not letting Ricky work away on the inside was always going to be detrimental to his game plan. Yeah, definitely. I, I don't like seeing referees getting involved. And Joe Cortez definitely, you know, didn't like Patton holding Mayweather and getting shots off with the other hand. Um, and he kind of let a lot of Mayweather's own dirty tactics go. He was... Mayweather was using his elbow and his forearm to, to set up set up shots really effectively. You know, as Andy said, he was probably getting the better of the inside as well. So that's why I don't think it was going to be a determining factor. I think it might have led to a, just a different kind of a knockout. Um, but I think uh, I, I still don't like to see referees kind of get themselves involved like that. You know, I'd rather just let the fighters fight or else be super strict about, you know, stuff like that. You know, you can't be picking and choosing when to take points and, you know, maybe impact fights like that. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. Uh, second round as well, Andy Floyd lands a flush right, right hand midway through the round. He tries to pot shot, tries to disrupt Hatton's forward momentum. You mentioned as well about Cortez. He definitely got busy in the second yeah. and third round. But I, I agree with you, actually. I, I, I remember him being a nuisance, but I haven't watched it, uh, obviously, now and t- before. Um, I watched it live on the night. But I thought, like you, after about round four or five, I didn't think he was too bad. I thought he kind of backed off a bit more than I remember mm-hmm. at the time. Absolutely. I mean, I'd, um, it was... I counted at least five or six times latter half of that round two. Um, he was getting involved. Just everything he was just getting mm-hmm. on top of everything. He wasn't allowed me to punch it out. He wasn't allowed anything to kind of form on the inside. I think if if it was looking like maybe they were just grappling arms and nothing was going to happen, he, you know, immediately he was getting straight involved. Round three, we mentioned that as well. It was more kind of round four. That's when he kind of like seemed to back off, kind of like then fighting some sort of kind of begin. Um, Again, Ricky got cut in round three, but is, is that is that is that third round went on? Actually, I thought Floyd commanded it in the end because he I think he caught hat with two pull back right hands, two quality shots. Um, but yeah, I remember the uh, round two really scrappy round, really horrible round to kind of sit and watch. You could probably even argue as, as to how you want to score that round. Actually, to be honest with you, I think that's maybe why Leatherman's card was slightly closer. Than, uh, than the official cards because I think he gave the first two rounds to Ricky actually um, even though that second round is, 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 is horrible um, you could even hear Uncle Roger in, uh, in the round between rounds two and three saying to him listen just pot shot your way to this so I really needed that actually Floyd wasn't it it was like he didn't even need to kind of go into his, his full array of skills he just kind of was mm-hmm. like check hook straight right hand and it wasn't until the kind of like latter half of that fight he started bringing the jab into play you know yeah and I think like a lot of the rounds had the same Kind of uh, when you know it would start off Ricky Hatton like like aggressive. aggressive getting up against the ropes trying to get shots in and then Floyd would kind of just take over and start coming with the flashy the flashy work the pot shots the flush shots and I was like you know he just seemed to nick almost every round for me I was I was struggling to give Hatton many rounds to be honest I couldn't see certainly not the first rounds second one maybe but uh, I I I, I, I like Floyd controlled most of the round. I just noticed here, Steve, on my note, actually, um, I don't know if you maybe caught this yourself during the, during the broadcast, but I counted at least in the third round. Cortez busy also. Must be double-figure breakups by the end of the round. That's round three. Really? In the re- yeah. one round alone? Yeah. Double-figure. Yeah. Uh, Would, wouldn't surprise me at all. He really was getting involved there as well. Yeah. And it, it, even though Ricky he was having a little bit of success with the leap, leaping left hook, as Joe said, Floyd started tagging him cleanly as he was rushing in as the rounds went by. There's definitely a cut, as Andy said, above the right eye. Mick Williamson dealing with that one. Well, it was a messy mauling round. The HBO commentary team, Andy, seemed to think it was Mayweather initiating most of the clinches. Would that be an accurate assessment? Um, I think so, such as because as to how Ricky was coming in. I mean, he wasn't really kind of, as we mentioned, he wasn't really setting it up, really. He was just kind of, I think he was getting, obviously getting a wee bit frustrated um, with Cortez. Uh, maybe allowed the miss to come down. He'd, he'd, be, he'd be desperate to kind of get some of his, some of his shots home. So he was just kind of like marching right in there. Floyd, as I say, he's, he's, he's check hooking or he's looking for the check hook. He's stepping back. But then, you know, you've got to buy time. You've got to try and, you know, you know find moments in the fight to try and try and recover, you know, because as we mentioned, and even Manny should mentioned, this was probably, you know, Floyd's hardest fight in a physical sense because Hatton was really was trying to put it on him. Um, but yeah, possibly he, he was tying it up. But at the same time, if you look at it when he was uh, initiating the clinches, as the fight kind of getting into the which we'll get into, kind of like middle half, actually, I was saying that that's when Floyd really, for me, started to take over on the inside and that. So 
in the end, he was he was working on the inside. He wasn't just kind of like holding just for dear life. He was actually getting a hold of Ricky from time to time, and he was giving some good good shots to the body, stepping but stepping off, and maybe getting a single right hand and maybe a check hook here and there so he could spin off to the side. But uh, Floyd, you know, was doing some good work, whereas Ricky was possibly getting nullified by Floyd, kind of like uh, using the forearms, blocking the shots, tying them up. Then Cortez would get involved, and then Flo uh, Floyd would find a moment where he would just need a single shot, and then Ricky's kind of getting frustrated again, mauling it back in again. You say mauling and brawling uh, for you know, basically a good heavy portion of the uh, for, for here to up to about round, I'd say about round eight. Um, it was really kind of heavy weather on the, on that inside. Yeah, Floyd not afraid to uh, spear in an elbow when required, which of course it's kryptonite to H Hatton's uh, delicate features. The rounds are progressing, fourth, fifth, sixth. Floyd's starting to find his distance. He's starting to land some of those sweet combination punches as well as the single shots. He, on the fifth, I had more pressure from Hatton. I think his stamina, his forceful aggression has always served him well, but he was neglecting to move the head as much, mm -hmm. Joe. His desire to get him inside, coming in head high, it's straight lines. It's food and drink, Joe, to a fighter of Mayweather's ability. If you're coming in, like I said, in straight lines with your head up in the air, he's just going to pick you off time and again. Yeah, and as you get more far and tired in the fight, you know, I think you're less inclined to to do the, the head movement as crisp as you normally would, would or when you normally would. And, you know, I, I think quite early on, you saw that same, like, play, if you will, that ends up in a knockout in the tent in, like, the second and third round. He catches hat and walking in towards him into the into the corner and fires off a left hook. You know, it stings hat and then, you know, it just kept on happening during the fight. And like you said, meat and drink really for an elite guy, eventually he's gonna gonna really, really hurt you. And that's what he did, sent him flying into the turnbuckle in the WWE stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, just before I play our first clip of the evening, a uh, flashpoint in the sixth round, Andy, to go mm -hmm. over. A lot of grappling, a lot of brawling at the start of the round. Joe Cortez deducts a point from Hatton for hitting behind the head. Hatton says Floyd turned his back. It's a dangerous foul hitting behind the back of the head. But without precedent, I don't think a point deduction is warranted straight away in this instance for that offence. I think a stern warning would have sufficed. Floyd is buoyed on by the break. He starts planting his feet more. He's had the break in the scores. He starts landing some more hard shots. But as the replay suggests, and I think Larry Merchant was right, it didn't even seem like it even hit Floyd. It seemed like Hatton's hand almost bounced off the top rope. Yeah, it was, it was an odd one, actually. I mean, I, I've, I've read comments as well that Ricky possibly even pushed Floyd through the ropes, and then he's obviously kept, came in there with the, the right hand over the top. It's caught the top rope as, as Floyd's kind of hanging over the middle rope. Um, I think, obviously, a stern warning. Would, would have been you know the best move obviously, but um, he took the point off. And to be honest, Floyd wasn't really overextending himself actually at that point either. But again, with the point coming off as well, I think this again is maybe Ricky's just got a bit anxious again, deducted the point, so he's chasing it back. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of thinking, looking at the way he's, he's, he's you see chin in the air, Floyd was then picking his moments, and then say, I just have a a couple of shots here and there at right who was an over aggressive Ricky, shall we say? Um, but it is, it is controversial. Uh, end of the day, uh, possibly because of the how he was kind of over officious in the right rounds two and rounds three, um, kind of like warnings here and there. Maybe he was just he was being over officious, shall we say, to try and stem any kind of like persistent fouling. But there was nothing really kind of persistent about that, really. Possibly Ricky just you know, he's got a bit. Over anxious, as, as I mentioned, maybe Floyd's turned his back, he's had a go at him there, and he's pushed him through the ropes, and maybe that's, I think it was a second right hand, possibly. But uh, I wouldn't take it, wouldn't, wouldn't have taken a point, no, I think it would have been a stern warning, would, would, have, would have been fair. I think so, yeah. Joe Cortez's uh, phrase was always unfair, but on firm, he was firm this time, but not necessarily fair. Just before the fight took place, there's always HBO ran the 24 7 series, a staple of boxing. I think it was Lee Schreiber used to do the uh, the uh, narration and the announcing and stuff. It was a fantastic series and there was some good insight in this one as well. I picked up as much as I could. Uh, Floyd and Ricky beforehand, we'll have a quick listen to what both of them had to say before the fight. Intelligent, smart fighter, smart moves. His trainer can't fight for him. My trainer can't fight for me. It's up to us to be the judges. It's going to be very embarrassing for him when he gets beat by 
a fat British kid who's fought loads of fighters over the hill, who's too slow, throws round punches, his footwork's too slow. How embarrassing for him to get beat by someone like that. Ricky's right, two fresh-faced guys there, Floyd himself with the hood up and Ricky Hatton with the little beanie hat on. Going into the eighth round, Joe, I thought the English crowd was starting to become a little bit more subdued now. Mayweather was taking over, he's dominating centre ring, the right hands are there, the left hooks are there. A little uppercut is being introduced as well into his arsenal. But one thing I was going to mention to you, Joe, Floyd always has had this impeccable timing in the ring and a fantastic clock in fights, like a body clock. He knew when to start raising the tempo, round by round, as the fights went on. He did exactly the same thing against De La Hoya. He just turned the temperature up as the rounds flew by. Yeah, his ring IQ is just off the charts, isn't it? Um, he just knows exactly, like you said, when to turn on the pressure and how to turn it on. It's very, very, very clever. And just the mix of his shots, like... Uh, he said the uppercut, you know, he, he he had a really, really nice kind of upper uppercut slash shovel hook in the inside that just you could see Ricky like, you know, didn't like it at all, kind of shook his head. Um just an absolute class act. You know, I really, really enjoyed watching this pack just to see kind of Floyd and full flow, especially in these rounds, like you said, he kind of shut the crowd up the best way to do it, you know, by beating their fighter. And yeah, he was he was with the right hands flushed down the middle that Ricky was walking on, so they showed some of them in between rounds. They were just oh, sickening shots, and it was just there from all night. You know, Ricky's Ricky's head moving like he alluded before, kind of went non-existent. I think uh, his, his corner was, was 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 saying as much as well, imploring him to try and go back to basics, move the head, but it just wasn't there from you know he was just getting picked apart there at this stage. Yeah, in the uh, highlight reel replays, Ricky's head was getting bashed about all over the place. He's starting to get desperate now. Round nine, the fight's slipping away, Andy, from him. He's working even harder. He becomes increasingly reckless in his attacks. On a slight side note, it was good to see Billy Graham in the hat and corner, the preacher man. He was a respected trainer from the Manchester area of that era. He ended up retiring because he couldn't hold the pads anymore. After this fight, obviously, he was unceremoniously ousted by Hatton. <laughs> Strangely enough, in favour of Floyd Mayweather Senior, that was a matchup that was never going to work out. But the preacher man in the corner, it really took me back to the days back, what, some 15 years ago? Yeah, yeah. I was thinking that myself, actually, to be honest with I was listening to his, obviously listening to his podcast, well, I don't know if it still is, actually, his podcast with John Evans. Yeah. Um, it was good to hear him, actually. But uh, see, I've not heard it for, for a few months, actually, to be honest with you. But he wasn't happy, actually, in, uh, in the corner because Ricky was obviously was taking too many shots, head in the air. For me, round eight is that absolute turning point of this fight for me, you know, because Floyd switched it up. Considering that Ricky is six and seven, he was being aggressive throughout those rounds, putting the pressure on Floyd. It was Floyd's turn to get aggressive. He switched it up. He started quicker as well. We didn't kind of let hat and come to him. He went for uh, for uh, for Ricky. He let his hands go, and Ricky was eating more right hands. Uh, I think it was either check cook it maybe even st- stood Ricky up slightly actually in that in that eighth round. So and then obviously as, as, as the rounds went on, Floyd started to kind of like get more shots off, teeing off on him. I thought Hatton began to look ragged at the end of round eight. And you can see it in round nine, he's still trying to press uh, Hatton, but Floyd he's moving, he's blocking, he's mauling as well, you know, when he has to. And uh, for me, Floyd was having the better moments, but round ten by this point, Billy Graham, as you mentioned, mate, he was he was livid. Concerned, really, uh, that, that he's just taking too many shots, telling him to move his head. But mm. you're in there round 10, you know, as, as, as Joe says, once you get, start to get tired and you get he's fatigued, tired, yeah. Yeah. fatigued as, and as I say, getting stood up like he did in that eighth round with that check hook, yeah, it's for me, but round eight is, is, is the writing on the wall for me watching this fight back because it was so clear to me when that left hook landed in the round eight that it was like, oh, it was I like something actually... switched, something switched in Ricky at that point. Sorry, Andy. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I noticed that um, Joe Cortez went over to the hat and corner. Mm-hmm. I think it was mm-hmm. after six or seven. It was quite early in the fight saying, you know, got to see you defending yourself more, you know. And taking too many he, shots. Uh, just taking too many shots, yeah. And even Hatton, he, the turning point hadn't really happened at that stage even, you know. But Cortez was obviously seeing something that maybe, you know, was coming down the line. Uh, yeah, Craig has jumped into the chat. Welcome to you, Craig. I think that's Craig Mastro knocking about. He said, Evening, lads. I was at this fight. It's been a while since I last saw it, but remember being frustrated by round five or six with Cortez and also Ricky's inability to change tact. Floyd was picking him apart. Shout out to Craig, who was there live on the night. Obviously, it wasn't quite the result 
uh, the boys were looking for, but it was uh, no doubt a great experience to be in there in Vegas. Uh, one minute into the 10th and final round, as Andy mentioned there, Joe Floyd lands a check left hook. Hatton simply never saw it coming. He's left sprawling on the canvas. His mouthpiece is nudged out of his mouth. He's tired. He's on the verge of defeat. He staggers back into the action. Seconds later, he's deposited back to the canvas. The referee waves it off. Billy Graham's towel floats in at the same time to signal the end of Hatton's challenge, Joe. Beautifully put, Stephen. Um, really set the scene it was. It's You see Floyd jumping onto the top rope, you know, being and pretending to cry. It's, it's a glorious thing. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, you know, very uh, dramatic finale, obviously. Very, you know, a, a knockout like that is, especially the way his head went into the turnbuckle, it was, it was, it was crazy stuff. You know, he was, there was a small bit of concern there, I think, initially, but uh, Hatton, thankfully, Warrior managed to get himself up. But uh, yeah, devastating knockout, definitive end to the fight, great fight, and a, and a, and a, deserve, a, a deserved great ending to it as well. Yeah, definitive is the key word there, Andy. Uh, when I saw him, I remember the, you know, the shot and he went into the turnbuckle. We all remember that. But then I was waiting to see what happened next. I couldn't remember quite out finished. I thought, I don't remember him getting called out, for, uh, counted out from the turnbuckle shot. He must have got back up and gone back out again. But at that point, he was done. He was finished. Mm-hmm. The referee knew it. The corner knew it. Floyd knew it. And it was literally seconds after the turnbuckle shot, Andy, he was finished. It was, me. I mean, he's literally marched at speed into that check hook. Literally, and he's like obviously like, head first in the turnbuckle. He's fell back on his back. He's got up at the count of eight. His legs are unsteady, Adam. And uh, <laughs> Floyd's just went to go and you know, cash him out, basically, because for what I can, uh, what I watched last night, anyway, is because we see it for the angle. I think Cortez is actually standing in front of Ricky, so you didn't even get to see if, if Floyd's two follow up shots at the end actually landed. But Ricky looks like he tries to kind of like duck his right, you know duck his head down, he tries to weave, but as he does mm-hmm. so, he just absolutely loses all equilibrium, falls over, and the ref, you know, Cortez just waves it off there, and then nothing else he could do, mate, he was done, absolutely done, as I say, marched at speed into that left hook and got absolutely obliterated by it, and uh, to see, like, it was, as, as we say, that 29, probably at his peak in that as well, was just, it ended there and then for that left hook, he was never the same again after that, mentally or or, or as a fighter. He certainly wasn't. Uh, Never one to give Floyd any props. HBO praised Hatton for bringing the best out of Mayweather. So sort of backhanded compliment if ever there was one from the boys. I I don't know if you watched the race through at the end, but I remember there was a bit towards the end, Floyd actually interrupted Jim Lampley and and, and Larry having a quick chat. And they were kind of like, Larry was kind of like breaking his balls a wee bit and that's just seen as we're just <laughs> we're just we're just talking about you there just to, we're just to commiserate your performance or whatever it was. But Manny Stewart I thought was quite right. He says that Hatton brought the best out of Floyd by not allowing Floyd to keep it safe and just like box it to a twelve round decision and bore the arse off of everybody. He forced him to close the show. I like that by Manny actually. You know, considering as well, he, he mentions throughout the fight as well that right hand is all he needs. He doesn't need to throw combinations. He just needs the single shots, and in the end, that's all he needed. Left hook, right hand, and sometimes a jab. Great comments from Manny as always. As we start to close out on our ending particulars of this particular episode, we've had Mayweather versus Hatton for punches from the past. Craig mentioned where he was during the fight. He was at the fight itself. We'll go through the panel here, Andy and Joe to see exactly where they were. Maybe Rapping Rob Kelly will throw us in a voice note as well if we're lucky. I've mentioned my story on the pod before, but I might as well go over it again. Um, It was the same night as the fight between John Duddy and Howard Eastman in the King's Hall. So I'd been at that fight that night and uh, with Danny Flexen, who was writing for Boxing News at the time, we bundled into my little white Clio and drove down to the Balmoral Hotel in Belfast and watched the fight. Gosh, it was on about four, half four in the morning. Watched it with Robert McCracken, actually, of all people, who was training Howard Eastman, and he'd been there, obviously, training Howard that night, and journeyman boxer Paul David. So that's how I got to watch the fight um, in the Balmoral Hotel. Where were you, Andy, um, when it took place? I was in the house, mate. I did the, the, the unthinkable thing. I'm um, just trying to remember if I remember, remember the dates, but I think it was that year that I decided to get engaged. And uh, so I didn't get to go because I was saving up for a house, uh, a house et cetera. And obviously an L for you and an L for me. Uh, an, an L for me because <laughs> the thing as well, I had, I had six months left at uni to do as well. So I was graduating the following September. So, um, yeah, I had to stay at home. I watched it on the telly few beers obviously that was back in the days when like the 4am jobs was, was not a problem to you, you uh-huh. know 
you know, there was no kids, you weren't like in your forties, not you know, unable to even handle handle two beers these days. So yeah, I was sat at the house, mate. Um I was I was stoked for absolutely stoked for this fight when mm-hmm. uh, it says I can remember when I think it was probably the poly fight as well after uh, afterwards. The same build up as well. All the build up shows, yeah, the, the Sky even replayed Polly getting his face broke against Miguel Cotto. That type of thing. That's when Sky were heavily, heavily invested in boxing. Yes. And Ricky, Rick, Ricky was 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 the flagship fighter. At that yes, time. he was the head he was, of that. Absolutely. Exactly. He 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 carried the British boxing for a good good period on his shoulders because I remember obviously even before I met the wife etc. And that and we be at mate's house for example the Costa Zoo fight. There was oh, it must be fifteen years uh, at my mate's house. And that all sorts going on in there uh, that night uh, getting on meal. Clubbing up for pay per view, uh, watch it like fucking early. It was at two in the morning, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what a state that was that Sunday morning trying to get him, man. Fucking hell. But uh, and I remember, um, it was, I can't remember if it was a class or the Arango fight. Um, I was up uh, uh, up in Thurso on holiday, actually. Managed to get a lock in in a pub locally to see and sit and watch it there. Uh, one of the, I, think it was, I think it was the Clazo fight, actually. So yeah, I have been the miles to, to, to watch Ricky, you not know, just know his fights as such. But uh, running about like pubs and mates' houses that day, I have clocked in the miles, both alcohol wise and uh, you know, uh, and obviously other things and that whatever as well. But it was uh, it was good times watching Ricky actually that time. You're talking about this would be what mid early early to mid two thousands when we're at our peak, Steve. Yes. We're at the party stage where uh, nothing nothing could bother us. You know, you could you could drink all week and still go to work in the morning. Uh-huh. Uh, these were these 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 were the peak years. These were our uh, these were our years. And uh, it was good times. And it was just a shame because you know, if Ricky had won that, I was, I was going to ask a question actually, would you have characterised if Ricky had won this fight, would it have been a bigger upset than Randy Turpin beating Sugar Ray Robinson or like Lloyd Hunnigan beating uh, Donald uh, Curry? Yeah, I was going to say Hunnigan Curry. It's hard to contextualise it because of yeah. the time, wouldn't it? But it would have been right up there. It would have been a massive one. I suppose we, we can say that now because we know what Mayweather went on to become. But looking back as well, it would have, it would have been absolutely massive, yeah. yeah. It would have been a massive one, yeah, definitely. Because if Floyd was like, he was even pound, pound for pound number one at yeah, that point, was, yeah, yeah, you know, so there was no dispute at that time. And Ricky, as well, he was the undisputed 140 champion, he beat the man who beat the man, so to speak. So there was no mm-hmm. dispute as to who Ricky was at that point. And he was pounding in the, the pounding the liver, Joe, like while Ricky was pounding the body. Where were you the night uh, Ricky went over and fought Mayweather? Yeah, I'd be lying if I could tell you, to be honest. I'm not 100 sure, but I, to be honest, I, I, I know... We'll waste you somewhere, then, if you can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. I think this is my college years, my prime years. Uh, now, I think... Uh, I, I know this fight more as a Floyd fan, to be honest, and going back, I, I do enjoy going back and looking at all Floyd fights and just catching up, catching new things almost every time you see him, you know, new little tricks he has or new little looks he has. And I just... He's a class act. He's For me, he's... You know, Rose Rice type level of, of, of boxing, and I, I just enjoy watching them. So that's kind of how I how I got more introduced to this fight than being a, a big Ricky Hatton fan, to be honest. Um, well, really, really, really love the fight. Like I think for me, for me, Floyd, like I said, he, he maybe lacks a little bit of power at the top, 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 top. But I think there's not 147 pounders who's walked the earth who. Have an easy night with Floyd Mayweather at 147. Uh, Craig has jumped back in again. He was there live and exclusive on the night. He said, I bumped into Floyd Mayweather Jr. a few days before the fight. And when I told him Hatton would outwork him, he told me he would make me a believer. And he did. Shout out to Craig, who was there for throwing in his comments. Keep them coming, Craig, before we finish up. I mentioned earlier the possibility of a rapping Bob Kelly voice note. How about upgrading you to a live voice note? Yeah, He's here with us know. now. When I, when I when I watched this fight, I was actually in the states. I was in Boston doing a show, and uh, me and my mate Tara we were trying to get in everywhere to fucking watch the fight with some some girls from Boston, and they were like, um, they were asking like phoning all their friends because the pubs don't show pay per views over there. Like so, it was like um, that we were trying to get into a house party, <laughs> and uh, if we were with some like uh, some Irish Americans or uh, ladies or whatever, and they were trying to get us into. Um, into house parties to watch the fight and nobody would let us in because we were off the boat and they said we're not letting them off the boat turkeys into the house and i said what the fuck does that mean turkeys and she said because you all talk like this so i was like right 
but eventually anyway we found a spot um thanks to the Regans, the Puerto Regans hooked us up and we found a spot to watch the fight but uh, we were giving Ricky a, a bit of a chance like um more in hope than anything like then just that he could do it because he was Ricky was a very popular character as you're after alluding to but again I'd be more on the Joe Kennedy side apart from his fucking prediction league me and Joe be on the same on the same page in terms of watching Floyd like I just I thought Floyd would always have the edge but not to name drop or whatever, but like when I went for dinner, dinner with Manny Stewart, it was only a couple of weeks after that, and the, or maybe a couple of months after that, in the um, in the run up to the B Hop and Calzaghi fight, and I was I was tipping B Hop to beat Calzaghi, and Manny was like, "No, Joe's gonna beat him, Joe, 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 all day, Joe, Joe, Joe." But I was asking him, he was like, "It depends who the referee is too." He's like, "Because um, Joe Cortez was fucking with Ricky that night." He said he didn't he didn't let him fight. Like he he definitely he he kind of pandered to Floyd in the in the post Costa Zoo kind of allegations about Ricky being a rough or whatever. So that was interesting. How it played out interestingly in the first couple of rounds. And there was definitely moments where when you're watching the fight live at the time that you thought Ricky was having the better of it. But once Floyd said I'm sure he's covered all that, but once Floyd settled into his rhythm and just got into doing what he does, as Joel said, like he's just a different level. And he walked Ricky onto the knockout in the end, didn't he? Like, it was fucking absolutely perfect. And that was the difference. Like, Ricky, it was about 40 fights in all or something at that time. 40 in all, so 40 fights unbeaten or something. A hell of an unbeaten streak. But he is a hell of a fighter, of course. Uh, and a hell of a competitor. But um, he wasn't as good as TBE, was he? Uh, Floyd got the job done. But that was a unique experience as well, watching the fight over in the States. Because nobody, none of them gave Hatton a shot. They were just like, Floyd's going to piss, piss on this guy. He's going to walk through him. Like, so... Um, different perspectives from different sides of the pond it'd be nice uh, I suppose if if we ever got to hear what Ricky's views on this big night in Vegas were because he's been very quiet about it post retirement <laughs> hardly ever mentions it does he <laughs> once or twice <laughs> but uh, no uh, great he, night he and it was brilliant I think one. He cashed in all those dinner speakers and he's talking about it then anyway, didn't yeah. he well I think uh, do you know what uh, as well as that like Going back to HBO, I was just looking at it. I think it's five years since fucking Ward and Kovalev were on HBO. It was one, probably one of the last good nights on uh, big HBO nights, but it was a big HBO production. And I think, I believe it was the first ever 24 7, was it? Or was it not? I think that was the, the yeah, inception. It was, of, it was. It was. And that was that the, definitely played, drew a lot of played. fans back into into Mayweather or whatever. I know maybe the De La Hoya one was the first one, was it? Oh, it was. No, was it? Wait a minute. Ah, it was De La Hoya. It was because yeah, it was then, 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 then they followed it on by, by, by Floyd because Floyd kind of took over that kind of mantle was like the 24-7 yeah. kind of like face, yeah, so he, to speak. He was the face of 24-7, but that yeah. was like, that was a brilliant, brilliant show. Like, and I know people have tried to, to kind of emulate it since and fallen short a little bit, but that I think draw, drew in a whole lot of a new audience into boxing because it was that kind of almost WWE way of selling a fight or building up a fight. It was brilliant, so... That, that's what something worth note, noting as well. But uh, yeah, I was in in the US back in the back in the heyday watching that one. Happy Mel Kelly was out there. It was a different time and a different era. Um, I've got oh, we've got Craig throwing us in another message. Actually, he said, "I missed the start, lads. Did you cover the national anthems? Once the Brits booed the anthem, the atmosphere soured around us as the Americans seemed pretty upset. We didn't actually cover that, Craig. But one thing I was going to mention was beforehand, it was a different time with Hatton doing his uh, Bernard Manning stand-up impression. I remember at the time Sky Sports profusely apologising at the pre-fight press conference. Mm -hmm. I've cut a little bit of it for you now. Hatton absolutely roasting Floyd. Floyd's just sitting there completely oblivious to the whole thing. But I tell you what, they wouldn't maybe get away with this. Well, even back then, they tried to cut it out. Here's Ricky on the stage. Thank you, that reception. I'm sure the crowd would like to agree with me, but if he dances like that in Dance with the Stars, he's fucking no chance, does he? <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming. It's great to be back in Manchester. <clears throat> we've, had, uh, a long, um, <clears throat> we've had a long tour, a very tiring tour, but it's nice to come back, see my friends, see my family. Floyd, will you stop touching me dick, you puff? Talking about my ass all week, kicking my ass, whooping my ass. I think it's, I think it's something wrong, with, you know. <laughs> oh, nice to see my family, my friends. Uh, you know, just great to be be back. Sorry, I've not brought the weather with me, but uh, I've missed me um, my son, my six-year-old son. I've missed uh, for a week, but I probably haven't missed him.
quite as much as you would probably think because I've had the fortune to spend the full week with another fucking six-year-old. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> It's mad, isn't it? Take, take those zingers, Floyd. <laughs> Floyd, but as you say, mate, whether you understand that kind of banter or not, you know, he'd be like, what the fuck are you talking about? But uh, you're right, actually, um, if, if you listen to Ian Dark on, on the on, on the Sky broadcast, sorry, he, he was saying that um, even like you know, the Americans running about him at the time, they were, they were raging about the national anthem getting booed as well. But see, uh-huh. to be honest, they deserve to get booed because I hate... I hate people that bastardise it. Actually, just sing it fucking properly. They need to drag it all out, like right? you know, like it was Tyrese Gibson that was, that was singing it. You know, I can hate the way that singers and they just sing it properly. And even Tom Tom Jones couldn't be fucking bothered singing "God Save the Queen" either. By <laughs> could he? he was like, he started off quick as fuck, then slowed down. It was like, it was like it was a complete mess, an absolute mess. He probably so, he uh, probably should have stopped when he started going "Spy on me, baby, you say." <laughs> He's probably waiting for Nickers to come in the ring or whatever on that, you know? <laughs> oh, dear. No, they should do away with the national anthems altogether. If Don yeah. King's anything to do with it, man, for me, it goes on forever, doesn't it? It does. I was saying to you, mate, I was watching Canelo against Smith there, actually. They actually had the three national anthems, the British, the, the Mexican and the American. I don't know why they played the American, just because it was in America or whatever, not a fucking joke, you know? No. Uh, on to the undercard. No, exactly. On to the undercard, just briefly, we'll mention who was on it. Uh, Danny Jacobs making his debut with a first round knockout. Danny Garcia, little known welterweight, went to 2-0 and with a knockout in his fight as well. Uh, Jonathan Aquendo was on the undercard. Uh, Jose Angel Rodriguez, Matthew Hatton with a win over Frankie Sanchez, and Edna Cherry with a knockout. And then on to the sort of main three fights, including Mayweather Hatton. Jeff Lacey, with, I remember it being a slightly controversial point to win over Peter Manfredo. He, he was struggling, Lacey, by this point. He'd lost to Calzaghe. He'd arguably lost his comeback fight against Vitali Sitko. I thought he lost that too. And then he struggled against Manfredo. That was a career just going right down south. And then Daniel Ponce de Leon um, with a win over Eduardo Escobedo. I don't know if you remember anything off the undercard, Andy, that really anything notable? Absolutely not, mate. I can remember a, that night sitting up there having a couple of cans, as I say, reaching for the bottle at one point, and I, I decided to put it back because I knew... I was in for a long night, as I say. Those those two undercar fights going the distance at four in the morning just was it was just was kind of heavy weather, not so. No, I didn't remember much about it apart from it. I just struggling to stay awake actually. Once the fight started, we were up for it, we we're ready to go. One of those fights actually, where you're kind of sat on the on the edge of your seat, just staring at the telly, just like waiting for something to happen. You know, uh-huh. they were the days, mate. They were the days. <laughs> Full of hope. Oh, on to the main event, but just back onto the main event briefly, Rob, a few statistics for you. I like you, you know, you like a few st- statistics <laughs> yourself. Burke, Burke Clements had the fight 89-81 in favour of Mayweather. Dave Moretti as well by eight points, 89-81. Paul Smith, not Smigger, had it 88-82. And the punch stats, I know we're not big fans of punch stats, but apparently Mayweather landed a total of 129 punches compared to Hatton's 63, which indicates to me Ricky did a lot of huffing and puffing, but also Ultimately, the extra quality came from Floyd. Yeah, I think. Yeah, and I think that's how it played out, wasn't it? Like you could see, you could see that it was Ricky was trying to jump on him in the early stages of the fight. Like and once, you know, he was. I think he he underestimated how strong Floyd was as well at forty seven and how strong he was in the clinch. And when he wasn't going to have his own way, Floyd just started pot shotting him, didn't he? And then hitting him, jabbing him downstairs to the body, and that was taking the wind out of him. And I think the preacher could see that as well, couldn't he? He was trying to he was trying to get on Ricky to change it. That was probably the fight where their relationship ended as well because I think the preacher was showing signs of frustration with Ricky because he was um I think that was uh, and it was kind of, that was kind of the, the end of their relationship and they, that was the last fight they had together wasn't it yeah, yeah it was yeah 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 so that was kind of an end of an era as well you know because um I always loved the two of them together if you know I know whatever goes on between grown men that's their business like but I love them as a kind of a double act um but yeah just. Ricky just fell short. He just wasn't good enough to beat Floyd Mayweather, and there's no shame in that, I don't think. Just as you wrap it up in the conclusions then, boys, Joe, over to you first of all. Floyd Mayweather, after the win, went on to beat Marquez. Obviously, he had a couple of years off, didn't he? And then he came back to beat Marquez. Mosley over the hill, the sort of headbutt incident with Ortiz. Good win over Cotto Guerrero, a fresh version of Alvarez. Back-to-back fights with Madonna, the past its sell-by date fight with Pacquiao, Berto, and then, of course, a final exhibition contest of sorts against Conor McGregor. Woo! He went on a nice little run there, Joe did Floyd. Yeah, fantastic run. Um, I think you guys covered um, 
more of the uh, Pretty Boy Floyd performance with, you know, probably his best, but the best Pretty Boy Floyd performance in the Chico Corrales fight in a, a couple of episodes back. For me, this could be up there with the best Money May performances. Um, this and Canelo, maybe, um, my personal favourite. But yeah, um, people try to pick apart his, his resume and say he caught guys at the right time. And, you know, he had all the stipulations and contracts and always, you know, pushed the needle towards him in any way he could. But at the end of the day, he still has the CV that he's got. It's a, it's a top class when he went through that list of of great fighters and he definitely is a great fighter and um, maybe not TBE but definitely for me certainly up there Andy two fighters careers going in very much different directions Joe laid out Floyd's there Ricky meanwhile Lascano in Manchester Stadium Malinaji State so a good knockout win actually in retrospect that one the bludgeoning by Pacquiao in 2009 and then of course an ill-fated comeback three years later against Senchenko we're on the eve of Hatton now. They're talking about November, fighting an exhibition against Barrera. He struggled with his demons outside of the ring with weight loss, with uh, personal issues, with alcohol issues and drug issues as well. Poor old Ricky. But his career was just spiralling downhill after this loss to Mayweather. Yeah, it was me. I mean, it was the end, as I say to you. I mean, to me, he went into the fight at his peak and then he lost it that same night. I mean, if you look at the, the he's running his career, you know, he had a good 20, 2008, sorry, um, kind of rebuilt himself a little bit, but again, as, as we mentioned, Lascano, who that was his last professional fight, he was winning the fight, and then Lascano wobbled him a few, uh, a couple of times late. He's went living rooms with Polly, and then obviously, as he says, he's, he's he's working with Floyd Senior at this point for the Manny Pacquiao fight. Uh, talking big again, and to be honest with you, it's quite prophetic when uh, prophetic when, when you actually listen to some of the kind of build up to this fight when Ricky's talking about. Uh, you know, left hand roll under. That is that is Manny Pacquiao's signature shot, supposedly. And then the Floyd picked it out to him and says, "Yep, you see that shot. You see that shot all the time." And what what shot was it that Manny knocked him out with? The left hand roll under. Uh, as Ricky Hickey tried to kind of throw his own right hand, or maybe it was a hook. I can't remember at this point. Uh, and absolutely iced him. And I always remember as well his comeback fight against Sinchenko, where um, he got badly dropped by a body shot. And you can hear the crowd willing them to get up, and they just couldn't do it. And to be honest with you, that was what 2012. That's that's 10 years ago. And here we are. He's looking to fight again in November. He's dropped 30 pounds. Obviously, he needs he needs to do something more than that. But you know, to to be back fighting exhibition or or otherwise at this point, I don't want to see him back. And the same goes for Floyd actually, because. I was reading some uh, some comments as well. F- Floyd should be far more marketable as an athlete and as as one of the greatest boxers of all times, but the criminal history goes against him, and that's what the, the, this is why we're seeing him double glazing windows, British hair clinic, fucking Papa John's pizza, whoever it is, you know, other shite that you get on Instagram. Um, that is the only reason why he does that shit. It's just for the extra extra bit of cash because he's non marketable to the like the mainstream, shall we say, because he's criminal past in my opinion at least so uh, but does it take away from him uh, you know for him as a fighter at least that we're talking about you know the fights at the end of the day he's run Cotto Alvarez the Maidana fights I mean the kind of showtime run shall we say it was it had its moments with some decent fights mm. kind of died died a death towards the end like you know no but Conor McGregor being a being a gimmick fight at the end of the day but as it says the one fight we all kind of looked forward to was was, was probably Shane Mosley I think if it maybe happened maybe 18 months before it did, when, you know, run about time, Mosley just beat Margarito. You know, I think that would have been the ideal time for that fight to get made. But instead, Mosley was at the ring for the best part of 12 months at least. So, but he still had enough to hurt Floyd. But after that, it was um, it was, it was all Mayweather, wasn't it? So, mm-hmm. yeah, great career. Uh, same goes for Hatton as well. Look, at the end of the day, no everybody can be world champions and no everybody can, you know, can create a following over the country, take um, essentially an army across to fucking Vegas, mate. It just yes. it doesn't happen. No many people can do that, if ever. You know, even the greats could, could never do it. You know, Floyd hasn't really got a big, massive following fan base as such compared to what happened. But, but uh, it was it's probably once once in a couple of generation type fighter that could actually draw the working man, shall we say? You know, just you know, for a moment, go at the pub. 
spend thousands of pounds to go to Vegas, whatever that to go and watch them. You know, that that takes that takes something special actually. To be honest with you, and these these were great times actually for the best. As I says the early two thousands to like the mid the mid half of the two thousand was absolutely fantastic for me for boxing. Well said, Andy. Uh, Joe, did you want to jump in there? No, just like, briefly when Andy was talking about Floyd and how he's not really remarkable when he should be, you know, as, as the greatest ever. I think he's definitely kind of seen as uh, like a bit of a David Brantish character over here, I think. You know, he's a bit of, you know, he's kind of diluted his brand so much with these, you know, madcap advertisements. He's... Crypto skeletons, Joe. <laughs> yeah, like, like, I, I work in the accounting world with the SEC and stuff like that. I know that, you know, when you give any sort of advice about making millions and making money with NFTs, you should be following up, but please do not follow this with financial advice, you know. <laughs> he doesn't have any of those Richard Dwyer <laughs> kind of, uh, you know, backpedaling uh, disclaimers. Uh, so I think he could be in for a world of trouble and probably might have to fight sooner than we think to try to pay for SEC bill. But um, yeah, it's kind of sad, you know, I, I, I love, Floyd as a fighter and it doesn't necessarily mean that your your favourite fighters have to be good people and marketable people but I'd like to see him doing a bit better than you know shilling boob jobs and nerf toys and all the rest of it you know Absolutely good stuff Joe yeah I think Floyd's lining up an exhibition in Japan as we speak uh, Rob final summation from you we mentioned about Floyd he had another 10 years at the top after this but as for Ricky as Andy mentioned it was kind of peak sky they were invested financially and emotionally in boxing we had Ian Dark on the commentary and Ricky Hatton for all of his faults he spearheaded that generation this was the culmination of it all those fans in Vegas it's fun to look back on these memories isn't it well, he does. He, he finally looks back at him anytime you put a fucking put a microphone in front of his fucking face. For, for us, Robert, for us. <laughs> Those two nights in Vegas. Um, no, listen, the two of them, I think there's a lot of similar similarities with the two of them in retirement in a, in a way. Um, even though Floyd never really hit the kind of the, the skids in terms of alcohol and drugs. Both of them, you can see, can't let it go. They can't let go of the, the mm. limelight from from the past. It, it, you see it with fighters. Fighters, you know, they don't even know that that they fucking haven't even fought at the level that they have. Still want to go back to those days and recapture the glory moments. Constantly talk about the past and what they achieved and that. And the two of them are very similar. And I think it is pretty sad um, in Floyd's case and in Roy Jones's case as well that they weren't more marketable to the to the wider public post retirement. I think Floyd could have done with some uh, stellar PR advice perhaps from the likes of a uh, Botox Lego sex doll to soften him up a little bit and make him a little bit more kind of appeasing to the public. But he's, he's abrasive, isn't he? Like he still wants to do young fly and flashy, even though he's old fly and not, and not so flashy anymore. Like it's, um, it's a bit of a kind of a circus act that a lot of fucking fighters have gone. A lot of great fighters have gone, you know, gone that down, gone down that road over the years. Like you had, you know, Robinson with the fucking, the dancing and the entourage and all that. You had Lamada. You had the countless other fighters who fucking gone hit the skids afterwards and can't let go of the glory years. So I think there's something to be said, or some some kind of parallel to be drawn between the two of them. But Floyd's career post Ricky Hatton, I was all in. I have to say, I really enjoyed that. Some of the I know he got criticism. He, the main criticism came from the casual boxing fan that he's ducking Manny, and I think a lot of that came in the immediate aftermath of the Ricky Hatton fight because everybody thought Pacquiao was the fight to make next and Floyd announced his retirement didn't he and that was like an inexplicable retirement like why the fuck everyone was like why was he retiring at that stage is there question marks over dope and stuff like that and... he needed to retire apparently because injuries or something like that I was out there for about two years I think after the Hatton fight mm-hmm. I was very suspicious like, well, call me cynical anyway but I was very suspicious at the time about that retirement I didn't understand it I didn't understand why he would do that if his hands were that bad he would have never came back in the fucking first place like so there was there's question marks over over Floyd and uh, on the dope. And I don't want to kind of just be a detractor of Floyd. I was a you know a massive Floyd fan as a fighter, like Joe Kennedy said, like he's elite level, one of the best, one of the best ever. He's not the he's probably not the best ever, but he's in the argument. He's definitely in the discussion for his weight class. And um I think a lot of the casual fans kind of turned on him over the Pacquiao thing or the accusations about Duck and Pacquiao. And then when the Pacquiao fight was made past the sell by date, they never forgave him. And that's kind of like he kind of left a bad taste in the fans, in the casual fans' mouth, because he didn't he didn't cater to them. He catered to Floyd Mayweather. But um, yeah, I think this fight was the kind of like I think this fight was kind of the the epitome of drawing in the last of the the kind of casual fights, uh, the casual fans rather. Um, you know, because it was Ricky with his big fan base fighting one of the best in the sport, 
and bringing all that together in one place in Vegas for a night. And the fight delivered as well. You got to say the fight did deliver in terms of spectacular finish. Ricky had a go. It was it had everything. It had the fans over there and that like so. But it set up Floyd for that put for the for the Showtime run or that post post Ricky Hatton run. And there was some fantastic displays of boxing in in that in those. Like you had your Robert Guerrero moments and your Berto moments. But two Maidana fights were crackers. I thought Cotto gave him a good fight. And um, the Mosley one had its exciting moment. So there was there was there was stuff there to that was kind of breathtaking at times. The Canelo fight, there was I thought there was there was moments in that fight where Floyd was just untouchable. He was like it was like watching the fucking human matrix, like he was fucking ducking shots, turning on the other side, moving him around. He should have they probably should have got the exclamation point on that and stopped Canelo that night because he was there for the taking, I think, but he hurt his hand. But um I kind of on a rant there a little bit, but yeah, that's the kind of. I think it it just kind of set the tone for the second half of, of Floyd's career, basically that night, didn't it? It certainly did. No rant from Rob. Great summation at the end of this live episode. Floyd Mayweather defeating Ricky Hatton. Thanks to everybody who's been on tonight. Andy Patterson and rapping Bob Kelly and Joe Kennedy has been with us as well. Shout out to Craig who was there on the night. He's been in the chat feeding us information. That's some forty odd now, forty five episodes of punches from the past. Uh, join us over on Patreon if you're not there already. If you want to get more of this kind of entertainment, Andy and myself are working feverishly now on season five coming up soon. We're going to pick the fights for that and get on with it. Thank you to you as well, Craig. Thank you to everyone who's a subscriber. We'll catch you all again very soon. I've been Steve Wellings and good night for now.